Good morning, everyone. My name is Joan Batorf, and I'm a professor here at the University of British Columbia's Okanagan campus and director of the Institute for Healthy Living and Chronic Disease Prevention. And I'm especially delighted to welcome you all here this morning. But before we begin, uh, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge, oops, hang on, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Before we begin, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that um, I am here on the Okanagan campus, and the Okanagan campus is situated on the silk, unceded territory of the Silk Okanagan Nation and their people. I also want to acknowledge that you are joining us today from many places, both near and far, and I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of those lands as well. So today we're, we're a bit sad, uh, but also delighted to welcome you to our very last session uh, in our Embrace Aging um, session and month. Throughout the month of March, we've had a number of events all related to uh, celebrating and raising awareness about positive aging. Um, we, Embrace Aging is co-hosted by the Institute for Healthy Living and Chronic Disease Prevention, Interior Savings and Credit Union, and also Interior Health. It was launched about nine years ago, and so this year was especially a great year um, as we've had uh, a record number of events organized through the month of March. And if you missed any of these events, if you go onto the Embrace Aging website, you can find some of the recordings. Um, today, um, as I mentioned, is our last session, and just a few housekeeping things before we start. Um, the closed captioning on your screen, you will notice, you can move that around to a place that might be more convenient for you, or you can turn it off using the live transcript button on your menu, menu, menu bar. Uh, I encourage you to type your comments and questions into the chat any time during the session, and we'd be delighted to uh, present those to our speakers um, at the end of their presentation. So without further ado, I do want to welcome our two speakers today. Uh, first of all, Dr. Kathy Rush, who is a professor here in the School of Nursing at UBC Okanagan, and Lindsay Burton, who is a research coordinator working with uh, Dr. Rush's team and is soon to be an incoming PhD student here at UBC Okanagan, which we're really excited about. So I'm going to turn it over to both Kathy and Lindsay to share some of their research with us today. Thanks so much. Thank you, Joan. Um, hi, and um, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, Dr. Rush and I will be talking about it's only as good as care at a distance for people with heartbeat irregularity. So we also acknowledge and are situated in the Slix people and unceded traditional territory. Uh, we want to acknowledge the funding for this project and this presentation uh, comes from the Canadian Institutes for Health Research and our additional team members, Dr. Jason Andrade, Dr. Peter Lowen and Dr. Ryan Wilson. We are supported by the University of British Columbia and have also partnered with Vancouver Coastal Health. So, uh, we work in the area of heartbeat irregularity, irregularity, particular atrial fibrillation with a focus on care at a distance and an interest in rural health. And since the expansion of telehealth during the COVID-19 pandemic, this has really radically changed how our interactions are with healthcare professionals. So what we're looking to explore during today's presentation is what is care at a distance? What does it mean for patients with heartbeat irregularities receiving specialist care? So as we try to answer this question, we want to know a little bit about our audience so we can gear some of our conversations specifically to you. So go. the first question is, you, do you have or do you know somebody with a heartbeat irregularity, such as atrial fibrillation? 
So we should have a poll up on the screen that you can answer and then we can see. Okay, so yes, we have 90% of our audience knows someone or has a heartbeat irregularity and 10% who don't but know about heartbeat irregularity. So we've got a little bit of familiarity in our audience. Excellent. Our next question is, have you used care at a distance, such as a phone or a video appointment with a healthcare professional? Doesn't necessarily have to be specialist, even like a general practitioner. Okay, so 91% yes, they have used uh, care at a distance and 9% have not. Excellent. Next question. Uh, we want to get to know kind of the age groups that we're, we're looking at. We've, we have um, so under 65, 65 to 74, or 75 and older. So we've got a nice spread. We've got 18% who are under the age of 65, 50 in that 65 to 74 age range, and then 32%. 75 and older. Thank you everyone for participating in these questions. And our last question is whether or not you live in an urban or a rural community. Excellent. 95% urban community and 5% rural. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you everyone for participating in our polls. Uh, we'll get back to kind of getting into the meat of our presentation and I'll pass it over to, to Kathy to walk us through the rest. Great. Yes, we're delighted to be here uh, to um, sort of end the, the series this year uh, with atrial fibrillation. And we have a very, uh, we have an audience that's very familiar with atrial fibrillation. So I'm not sure that I even need this slide, but just in case. Um, so what is it uh, for those of you who perhaps are less familiar with it? Um, with, in a normal heart, um, we know that it is, a, we do know that it is a um, electrical disturbance of the heart um, and uh, an abnormal heartbeat. And in normal sinus rhythm, we generally have our electric signals starting in one place in the heart. So in the upper chamber, in what is called the pacemaker, uh, we have these electrical signals and they travel down to the lower chambers and they produce this sort of very nice regular heartbeat beat. However, in atrial fibrillation, we have multiple signals that may come from different places uh, in the heart, uh, and they cause a great deal of confusion <laughs> and chaos in the electrical circuitry, and they produce this very fast, irregular heartbeat. Um, and what that does then is it means that the uh, lower chambers of the heart are less effective in getting blood and oxygen to all parts of our body. And that's why people with AFib often have complaint of uh, symptoms such as shortness of breath, uh, some dizziness, uh, it, and these vary from patient to patient, but they often are tired, fatigued, exhausted, even after they uh, perform some activity oftentimes, although it can occur at rest. Uh, they can sometimes experience chest pain, but they often complain of certainly feeling like they have a racing heart or it's like a quivering sensation uh, in their chest. Some people describe it as feeling like a frog jumping in their throat, in their chest, or even a fish. Um, that's, uh, you know, sort of in their chest, um, floundering around. And so they have various descriptors uh, of uh, their symptoms, but certainly uh, it does cause an erratic, a very rapid uh, and irregular heartbeat.
And I should have probably mentioned too that not everybody is symptomatic. So people with AFib don't necessarily have any of these symptoms and they're not even aware that they have it, which is one of the, the you know, the concerns is that you may have it, but not realize it um, because you are asymptomatic. But, um, and there are risks associated with atrial fibrillation. Um, certainly as we get older, um, age is a risk factor. We are, uh, the prevalence of atrial fibrillation uh, goes up as we age. And so, especially 65 years and older. And so people in, um, and I see some other comments about other symptoms that people are experiencing there too, nausea and other symptoms as well. Thank you. Um, but um, so in, uh, so each decade as we age, we are, uh, our risk of, of developing AFib does increase. So in patients who are between like 65 and 74, um, there is a probably about a 6% prevalence of AFib, but that increases to over 16% in people who are over 85 years of age. So uh, the risks just go up. Up. Um, and with when AFib is not treated um, or when it's poorly managed, it increases the risk of stroke. Uh, and that's one of the most devastating uh, complications of atrial fibrillation. In fact, it can increase uh, five, a five-fold risk uh, in patients who have uh, atrial fibrillation. It doubles the risk of dementia. It triples the risk of heart failure. And that's where the, the pumping action of the heart is ineffective, uh, and it increases overall risk of death. And atrial fibrillation can be challenging to manage. Uh, for those of you who have it, you may or know of someone who has it, you may find that it ha actually has had its challenges. Um, and that's because it, it, it is often a progressive and unpredictable disease um, where, you know, someone can start and have maybe just a single episode of AFib and it quickly resolves, uh, but they can progress to having it more regularly, um, frequently, and then they can even progress to having it on a, on a, on a permanent uh, chronic basis. Um, for the most part, primary care providers can manage the care of patients who have atrial fibrillation. So your GPs are often the people, right, who are helping you to manage your uh, AFib for those of you who, ha who have AFib and are in the audience. Uh, but specialist care is often needed uh, during the disease's progression, um, just simply because um, as it progresses, perhaps, or um, certainly there may be um, a treat, like you may have certain treatment, but then you have a relapse, you're moving from sinus risk them back into atrial fibrillation, you may need to have specialist care at some point during your journey um, and life with AFib. And so specialty AF clinics really have evolved to meet the needs um, uh, for specialty care. And they've been particularly helpful for meeting uh, needs um, for people who, you know, in accessing that specialist care. They are typically comprised of a team of people, uh, electrophysiologists who uh, specialize in the electrical circuitry of the heart and cardiologists, um, nurse practitioners, nurses, pharmacists, so a whole team of people. And they have been shown to be very effective in reducing healthcare utilization. So uh, patients who um, have care through these specialty clinics have been shown to have decreased utilization of hospital, you know, hospitals or uh, hospitalizations. They may have fewer emergency department visits, and over and of course, in in decreasing the utilization of healthcare services, it also decreases healthcare costs. But at the same time, it actually has been shown the, these clinics have been shown to improve health behaviors, lifestyle behaviors, uh, as well as quality of life for patients with AFib. So there are a lot of really benefit there are a lot of benefits to specialty care uh, for sure. Now we know that um, or pre-COVID, um, most AFib specialist care was only available really in urban centers and required uh, in-person visits, which meant that people, especially um, from rural and distant communities, had to travel quite some um, distance. But we know that COVID has changed all of that, and now remote care or care at a, at a distance is commonplace. But there has been very limited research looking at the use of virtual AFib care delivery, and mostly what has been done um, has focused really on the patient's ability to use the technology and their overall satisfaction. But what has been largely missing from the research has been the patient experience. So what do patients say about uh, their visits um, with the specialist clinic? And of course, this is important. It's important to learn about patient experiences because um, as virtual care is likely to continue into the future, uh, we want to we want to be able to support patients with the best possible model of specialist care, and so uh, learning more about their experiences is very valuable towards that end. 
Okay. So what we, what we have done in order to explore this is we partnered with a specialist atrial fibrillation clinic in one of these urban centers in order to distribute some surveys and host some focus groups in order to gain a little bit more in-depth information about the patient experience. So we, we did a combination of surveys, also looking not only at the experiences, but like Kathy mentioned before, the previous research, you know, um, capability of using the technology and satisfaction with the technology, as well as then hosting focus groups to contextualize and deepen our understanding of that, specifically the experience of receiving specialized atrial fibrillation care at a distance. So the atrial fibrillation clinic uh, that we partnered with, uh, this clinic, much like we alluded to, specializes in short-term pathways for patients. So essentially what happens is patients will be diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, either in an emergency department when they present with symptoms or after having been managed with, a, with their family doctor or their general practitioner for a while. And if they feel that they need a little bit more help or support, they get referred to these specialty clinics who then follow them for a period of time in order to help them manage and can get control of their symptoms. So, and the clinic that we partnered with is a multidisciplinary team. They have a nurse practitioner, a pharmacist, a registered nurse, cardiologist, and electrophysiologists on their team. They do follow-up, they do education, they do ablations, which are you know, ways to manage some of the electrical circuits in your heart in order to reduce the symptoms of atrial fibrillation. And what their, their goal is, is to optimize your treatment and management of their patients over a six to 12 month period to then move patients out of the clinic back into the care of their, their general practitioners for further follow-up. So this is the, the clinic which we partnered with and situated ourselves in for our research. So, so what we did was we had all of the patients with incoming appointments were sent a notice of research from our team uh, where they were said, we've got the study that you might be interested in participating in. It's looking at your experience of atrial fibrillation with receiving care at a distance, and you might be contacted by the research team to invite you to participate. So all of the patients received this notice and were contacted by a research team member over the phone, inviting them in to participate. And Patients were then directed to an online consent form and an online survey in order to get into our study. And any participants that you know, had trouble with using an online survey were given support and we did a few over the telephone with people as well. And then after the surveys were collected, we then invited a subgroup of participants to, to take place in a series of focus groups that we held. So the survey consisted of demographic information and health history, you know, when you were diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, your quality of life, how, your, how you would rate your general health, how you would rate your general mental health, um, how much you use the healthcare system, you know, if you've had any recent hospitalizations or trips to the emergency department, measured self-efficacy, your belief in whether or not you can do something. We looked at your general self-efficacy, your self-efficacy around the use of computers, the use of virtual care technologies or healthcare technologies. We also looked at stress, which can have an impact on your symptom experience of atrial fibrillation. We looked at lifestyle measurements, which again have some um, implications for, for your experience with atrial fibrillation. The satisfaction with the virtual care or care at a distance experience, and then also the, your knowledge or participants' knowledge of atrial fibrillation. And then our focus groups, they were held over Zoom. We did all of our, since all of this was happening during the COVID-19 pandemic, we held all of our focus groups over Zoom and everyone was invited to interact and discuss with other patients specifically around the experience that they had with virtual care or receiving care at a distance, their perceived quality of virtual care and what technology supports and, and other uses they, they would hope to see in the future recommendations. So we took all of that information. We are still in the process of analyzing a lot of these data. This is in an ongoing project. So most of the survey results that will be 
sharing with you today are preliminary work and then the, the focus group data is really going to be the majority of what we focus on today where we did an in-depth thematic analysis and tried to tease out a lot of these experiences of our, of our participants. So give you an overview. We have sort of our two distinct groups, our overall, everyone who participated in our survey, and then all of our participants of the focus group. So in all, we had 189 participants fill out our survey from the clinic. They were um, on average 65 years of age. The majority of them were married. They were mostly Caucasian and they tended to be college or college, college, some college education or college graduates. They tend to be a little bit higher education, um, Caucasian, married, and around 65 years of age. And our female population was a little bit older and we tended to, we had a lot more men in our sample than, than women, which is not uncommon for, for atrial fibrillation. Then for our focus group participants, we had 30 of those uh, 189 survey participants take place in our focus groups. So they were similar to our survey participants in that they're around 66 years of age, still mostly married, uh, mostly Caucasian and college, college graduates and uh, college educated. And still we had uh, more men than women in our focus groups as well, not unexpected for this, for this topic. So what we were looking at generally, and this is our focus group participants, is what kind of appointment were they having when they came into the clinic? And the majority of appointment types were we classified as other because we're still working on refining our categories. And this is inclusive of people who have just had a cardioversion where they kind of re-jumpstart your heart to get it back on a, its regular rhythm or just follow up because they've already been seen at the clinic or even education only. So we're working on refining that category a little bit more. We had around 30% of our participants who were new consults. So this means that they were newly diagnosed with atrial fibrillation recently and have, had never been seen in the clinic previously. So most of these participants because of the timing of our study had never been seen in the clinic in person. So this plays into a little bit of their experiences that we look a little bit closer into in our focus group data. And then our next type was ablation. So these are patients who are coming in for a surgical procedure, um, which is a little bit more involved and one of the electrophysiologists takes care of. And beyond the appointment type, what we're particularly interested is how were people having these appointments? Um, the, uh, this clinic is set up and has the capability of doing video appointments and telephone appointments with their patients. And so we saw about 90% of our participants used phone as their modality for the care at a distance appointments that they were having with their either the RN, the pharmacist, the NP, or their cardiologists. And only a uh, a slight few had video appointments. And overall, um, I've got a couple of graphs here that are looking at the differences between these age groups that we had you fill out at the beginning of the presentation. And we've got the average here on the red line of all of our survey participants. So our focus group participants and our survey participants were all in line with their satisfaction with their virtual care, their satisfaction with their communication virtually, their computer self-efficacy and their health technology self-efficacy. And of particular interest to us, there were no differences between the age groups. Um, some of the, the research has been done previously, you know, there's concerns with people who in older age categories being, um, having challenges with doing virtual care because of the technology. And we didn't, we haven't found anything that, that really shows any difference in people who are under 65 years old and even the 75 and older groups with respect to their satisfaction with care at a distance or their belief in their abilities to engage with computers or healthcare technology. That summary, I'll pass it back over to, to Dr. Rush to talk a little bit more in depth on the focus groups. Great. 
Um, and this is certainly not a, a complete analysis. It certainly is, again, just uh, in progress, but uh, we wanted to share a few of our findings uh, for today's presentation. So what did patients really say about their experiences of virtual care? Well, they did talk about their, the very practical benefits of, of care at a distance, and we're using that virtual care and care at a distance in, interchangeably here. Uh, they talked a, a lot about communication. That was a pretty important aspect of their experience, the fit of care with their health needs and then the future um, of virtual care uh, from their perspective. Okay, so in terms of um, the benefits, certainly patients uh, were overwhelmingly supportive of virtual care during COVID, both to protect themselves and to protect providers and staff. Uh, and they, um, they had several practical benefits that they um, that they had derived from using uh, virtual care. They found that they could integrate it better uh, into their daily lives. And so whether they were at work, whether they were on vacation, whether they were out shopping, uh, they were able to do their virtual appointments um, at the clinic. Um, regardless of what they were doing. Uh, they could do it at home, they, so they could do it out and about. Uh, one uh, of our participants was on vacation at quite some distance from the clinic uh, during uh, his initial consult, and he didn't have to drive all the way back to the clinic. He could actually just, you know, have his appointment uh, and then pick up with vacation uh, plans with his family. So it was very convenient uh, for many participants. Uh, they also, and important to COVID, were really thankful for not being kept waiting in the waiting room. Um, not only to decrease exposure to COVID, but also just if in fact the provider was delayed in seeing them, uh, they didn't, they could sort of carry on with what they were doing and then just join in on the appointment uh, when the time came. And so that was very uh, beneficial for many patients because they did find that they actually had some fairly significant wait times at times uh, for, the, uh, for their providers. Um, they also, of course, those especially who lived at a distance, um, and um, I think, I'm not sure that men Lindsay mentioned it, but we did have patients who lived like obviously um, very very close to the clinic like within walking distance of the clinic and those who live like like a tremendous distance like over 2,000 miles from the clinic so uh, a, there a really big spread in terms of where people were from coming to the clinic and uh, so for those people um, needing airfare or to drive uh, it certainly was cost savings um, and not having to get accommodations that they might need to have, not having to find parking, um, paying for all of those things were extremely beneficial, positive um, things related to virtual care. And with all of those things, they also found that it was a bit less stressful. Uh, they were more relaxed in some ways uh, because they didn't actually have to navigate uh, some of the things that you normally have to navigate when you do an in-person visit. And they also talked about the opportunity to, inv to involve a family member um, in, the, in the appointments, which sometimes wasn't always possible if it was in person. And so um, one of our male participants said, you have the freedom, the flexibility to keep doing what you're doing and then just set that time aside when you're expecting a phone call. And this is another, um, so this is getting uh, this particular participant um, who lived in, on Vancouver Island talked about not having to take the ferry and the cost with ferry and find parking spots. And so personally really preferred the conversations over Zoom than in person for those particular uh, benefits. Communication was a, a recurring issue related to patients' overall perceptions of their virtual care experiences and how well it met their needs. Overall, um, patients did talk very, very positively about their uh, communications with the clinic and providers, and they found them highly effective. They also, as Lindsay alluded to earlier, they rated high satisfaction with, with the virtual communication with providers and the, and the team uh, at the clinic. They did, however, relay some challenges, as you might expect um, with any kind of uh, modality. Uh, like all the other um, variables that Lindsay uh, presented as well, we did not find any, um, any age differences in terms of their um, satisfaction with the communication. So when patients talked about communication, they really boiled it down to kind of the set, the patient as the sender, the provider as the receiver. And it really all boiled down to patient's ability to be able to focus 
uh, and to adequately communicate their needs and concerns and the provider's ability to listen and interpret the information and then to act um, uh, on that information to be able to help support and resolve the, the, the issue that the patient was presenting with. Uh, and you'll see uh, that our participant who was furthest away from the clinic had this to say. She says, my observation is that virtual care is really only as good as a patient's ability to communicate issues and successes they may have had, and is only as good as the provider's ability to listen and, the, and in the end interpret. So if patients were able to communicate, if providers were able to receive the information and act on it, uh, interpret it and act on it, it was a very effective um, patient-provider uh, communication encounter. Uh, and we have a very happy uh, participant here in this uh, female um, from the Urban Center who basically talked about um, having had a, you know, ups and downs with her heart heartbeat irregularity and had a conversation with her provider. She was, she said, I, I was able to describe how I was feeling and the situation and the provider totally understood what I meant. Of course, having also access to some of her files because she was a, a more established patient. Um, and so they made some changes in the medication and the patient said, voila, it disappeared. The problem disappeared. And the comment um, that she made, I thought my, my goodness, this is really good. Even though it was a phone call really does show how you know very very positive that particular encounter was and how very effective it was in her in in the at the communication level however we had other patients who really had more challenges in terms of the, the communication with their providers, or they had a few more doubts, I should say, self-doubts about the communication with their providers uh, that was done virtually. Uh, and remember that most of our participants did their virtual um, appointments by phone. And so they didn't have this, even the Zoom luxury of visual, any kind of visual data to be able to share. Uh, so, so patients did express a great deal of uncertainty and lack of confidence in the adequacy of their communication. They, uh, they really, really expressed a lot of a sense of burden of having to really um, be up to being able to provide all of that necessary, all of that information to their provider in order to be able to have their provider um, help them uh, with the problem. So they had questions about really, am I, am I uh, communicating what's necessary? Am I even communicating correct information? Is it complete or have I forgotten some details? Uh, are my descriptions really enough? Um, especially when um, I'm having to, you know, I'm having to use the phone and just the audio as my sole way of communicating. They also um, just questioned, is my provider really able to interpret clinical symptoms the same virtually as they would if I was seeing them face to face in an in-person visit? Will they come to the same conclusion without seeing me taking my pulse or using a Holter monitor to gather um, a rhythm strip of my heart? Um, and so one participant, a uh, female participant says she was really nervous initially. She, you know, without being seen, having her blood pressure taken or having anybody listen with a stethoscope to her heart and any of that kind of physical stuff, she said, because I was having to describe my symptoms. And she says, I wasn't sure I was covering everything and if anything was being missed. So like I say, there was a quite a bit of um, uncertainty um, and self-doubt with patients uh, in terms of the communication uh, done virtually. Another aspect of that kind of sender-receiver uh, communication also was related to distraction. Patients did talk about um, the phone in particular, um, not so much not so much the, the uh, video conferencing because there were there were so few who actually use Zoom, uh, but they they basically talked about really being distracted depending on what they were doing when they were uh, engaging in their in their appointment with the providers. And so this one particular patient talked about being at work and says. And he was a foreman, actually, um, and just in his office at work. And he said, trying to receive, you know, trying to do his appointment that particular way. And he said, like, you know, I've got a million distractions uh, that I'm thinking about. And you don't really concentrate when you're, you know, like you would when you're in the doctor's office. And you probably tend to forget more things because you're so distracted. So there were patient-related, you know, uh, things that related to that distraction and that inattention, but also they talked about the provider um, being late for an appointment, for example, that might also put them in a, a space where they couldn't attend. And so one patient talks about having a scheduled appointment, uh, the provider being detained, that that person, you know, getting in their car to travel, 
you know, from point A to point B because the provider was late and they needed to be somewhere. Uh, and then they're saying, but hey, suddenly 20 minutes out and you're driving in traffic and it's pretty hard to focus on something that you want to focus on. So again, just that element of distraction that really then had um, had an influence on communication, what was communicated, um, how it was communicated and that type of thing. And then there was, there was, so there were different levels of effectiveness that patients perceived. Like I, I mentioned about very effective communication when everything was in place, patients could um, communicate um, and providers could, could receive the information and, and act on it. Then there were those people who kind of uh, questioned how effective it was. Uh, and then there were, were others who really found it quite ineffective. Um, and so this particular uh, male particular, this patient had had an ablation uh, that didn't go so great uh, and they really needed to talk about it. And so they said that really, honestly, the phone didn't cut it. And, uh, you know, yeah, it didn't go well. And um, I needed the kind of the in-person visit for more reassurance. Um, and they described the in-person as more organic. You, you sit down, uh, they can read you, you can read them. Um, and they just found that, you know, that kind of that personal conversation that really happens more naturally. And they felt that they could really cover what they need to with their, with their provider. And so again, just, you know, in some, in some cases, people finding it extremely ineffective um, in being able to uh, get at the, the root of, of their health need. The next, um, the next sort of theme that I, that I want to talk a little bit about is about the fit of care at a distance. And so patients often gauge the quality of their appointments according to its fit with the nature and complexity of their health problem, the stability of their AF. So if they were quite stable, um, you know, versus whether they had relapsed and gone back into from normal rhythm, sinus rhythm back into AFib and the extent of the decision making involved. So um, again, if, they, if, if it was more involved, again, uh, that influenced their perception of the fit of the uh, virtual uh, appointment. And so if in fact it was a pretty simple, straightforward kind of quick resolution, uh, they found that the virtual care was a pretty optimal fit for them, such as prescription refills, receiving lab racks, or quick questions, mundane inquiries. As one uh, female participant who had an ablation, I think it works very well for things like medications and just those questions and just questions. But it wasn't seen to be really optimal when patients really had more complex things going on or when they were in kind of this unstable place with their AFib or whether when they were making sort of some really serious decisions. Uh, so and, and for patients who were newly diagnosed, so people newly consulting uh, at the clinic really found that uh, there were some challenges in terms of just the fit um, of virtual with their immediate needs. So when they were making serious health decisions or even when they were experiencing post procedure procedural complications and they didn't really know what the next steps were and what was, you know, what they could expect. Uh, they, they felt like they needed more than the virtual care. Um, and when patients lacked capacity, so in some instances, if there were, were memory um, impairments or perhaps they, there were struggles with using technology, uh, there, there was that tendency perhaps not to consider virtual care a good fit. Um, some patients also talked about education, particularly those who wanted um, more uh, information, so uh, an in like that an in-person visit might afford. Uh, so they wanted more explanation. They maybe even wanted some supplement, supplemental visual aids, like patient, you know, providers to draw pictures for them and those types of things. They didn't feel was possible uh, easily, as easily with virtual care. And so this one male participant says, "So if I'm sitting down with a physician and I'm discussing a diagnosis and some serious issues as to choices that must be made, I think really a face-to-face -face is really the way." to go. And I just really wanted to point out some of the uh, challenges with the new, the patients with new, a new AFib diagnosis. Um, remember that these new consults had never, had never been at the clinic. And so they really, um, they really didn't really have any kind of um, context for the for the physical space right within which the clinic was housed and so uh, one participant described it as a big black box and so they didn't have that they also didn't have they lacked that established connection with the clinic team and though many of them spoke very very highly of some of their appointments with the whole team um, they still didn't sort of have that sort of same comfort level that others would have had who had been seen over a period of time with the the clinic uh, staff and therefore because they didn't have that established 
establish uh, connection, they also felt that there were, they lacked some, there was just gaps in trust, especially when uh, participants said the people that you're putting your your life in their hands right you want to be able to trust them and um, um, and they didn't really know them that well uh, to feel that they had that level of trust they also talked about just not not and and lacking some compassion compassion a degree of compassion um, that they felt would better be served with in-person care and they needed a lot of validation and reassurance with their new diagnosis as they face this new diagnosis and the sort of the what their what the expectations in terms of uh, treatment um, options would be uh, they also had some gaps in knowledge needs relate, related to the treatment pathways uh, and options so um, that's, so the, the newly diagnosed patients, I think, had a few more challenges than some of the ones who had been seen um, over a period of time pre-COVID. Yeah, and this is one, one male particip participant uh, kind of alludes to the last point about wanting to know what the paths are to get me through it um, and didn't have that sense, but felt they needed to, to create it themselves. So, um, and that may not just be a virtual thing, but, uh, you know, certainly we're talking here about virtual care and their experiences with virtual care. The final, um, the final uh, really theme that we wanted to just mention today was the future uh, and how um, patients really responded to virtual care in terms of their, even their, um, whether they would want to have virtual care in the future, and many of them did. Uh, they wanted continued continued use, of course, look, considering fit um, would be very important, nevertheless, but they did uh, have some concerns, and a couple, just a couple of concerns that I'll mention, just in terms of providers taking on more patients and maybe being less available, and also just the concern about virtual care becoming usual care rather than in-person care, uh, because most of their, uh, of course, most of their care at that time was um, virtually done. But they did have some suggestions and of course, as you might expect, um, uh, they did suggest a hybrid model, so a combination of both virtual and in-person. They also talked a lot about integrating some of the data that they were collecting because many of them actually were collecting all of their own data. Uh, they had Apple Watches and so they were collecting, you know, certain information. Uh, they had other kinds of um, technologies as well and so they wanted to be able to integrate um, and have that integrated into their virtual care, particularly because they were so dependent on the phone uh, and without providers really seeing them, um, or they, they really felt like that would really actually help to supplement much of what uh, of the care that they were receiving. Uh, so those were just those are just a few of the, uh, the suggestions that they had. So Lindsay, do you want to just finish off there or? Yes, sure. So um, all of that brings us back to, so what does care at a distance, what is care at a distance and what does it mean for patients with heartbeat irregularities such as atrial fibrillation receiving specialty care? And we've come to the conclusion that it is, as our title suggests, it's only as good as one, your ability to effectively communicate your needs, wants to your physician and your physician's ability to then interpret that information that you're providing and the fitness of your particular health needs. As we've been reflecting on this, um, you know, there's there are tons of benefits to receiving care at a distance that we mentioned, um, convenience, travel, cost, et cetera, and, and not just for our road remote and rural communities, but people living in these large ur urban centers, it, it could be quite a hassle getting to some of these centers with parking and traffic and time, time off work, trying to navigate, you know, childcare or, or any of those multitudes of things that, that goes into getting to healthcare appointments. But if the fit doesn't outweigh the benefits, that's really what what we came down to is that the benefits don't necessarily outweigh the, the appropriate modality. Um, and patients alluded to, we, I'd rather travel than save the convenience of telephone when getting a serious diagnosis or, or needing to have one of these more in-depth conversations and having the comfort and, and trust with their provider team. So um, we, as we reflect on this, we, we wanted to pose the question back to, to our audience as well, but whether or not, you know, some of the things that we've discussed today, you, you feel reflected in your own experiences and, and what you would like to see, what you would like to see is the future of care at a distance.
Thank you so much. Uh, I've got a million questions, <laughs> but I know our audience has some questions too. And so uh, thank you again for sharing that uh, research. Um, I think your findings are really, really interesting. So we already have some questions and comments in the chat box. So um, I think I'll try to start at the top and uh, work down um, just to let um, people who've joined us know you might not be able to see them all because uh, some of the questions uh, were sent directly to the panelists. However, that being said, I'm gonna read them out so everyone <laughs> can hear them. Um, and the first question is from Barbara. If the atria is irregular, why is my ventricular beating so fast? Is the pulse rate the beat of the ventricle? Uh, so a little bit of a medical question there. I don't know if you're ready to answer that or not. What do you think, <laughs> Kathy? Well, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Yes, uh, it, there, could, there could be possibly like mixed rhythmias too, but uh, really the... the um, the pulse is really both. It's there's a love dub, right? There's a love dub that happens, right? And so it's really both of both uh, the upper and the lower chambers uh, that are really needing to work to, um, you know, deliver the electrical um, uh, stimuli, but also they are working mechanically to deliver the oxygen to, oxygen to where it needs to go. Uh, so I don't know the uh, the question was why is my ventricle um, beating fast? Uh, yeah, um, I think that um, it probably is a it may be a compensatory, you know, it may be that the, the heart is having to compensate um, also for, um, you know, not being able to, not getting sort of the necessary um, electrical circuitry uh, in the way it's supposed to. And so they may, it may just be a way, uh, the way that your, um, your lower chambers are having to compensate for that. They're, they're beating fast because they're having to, to try and get out. Normally they would have this nice regular rhythm. And so you'd have nice, um, a nice push of blood and oxygen out from those lower chambers, but they're having to beat really fast to make up for that, that that's not happening. So they're having to work actually harder uh, to get that blood, that blood out, uh, mm -hmm. that blood and oxygen. I'm not sure if Joan, Joan, do you think that answers it? <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's pretty good, actually. I, I think I would have uh, said exactly the same thing. So Danielle, also kind of a, a, a question, I can imagine this is very difficult for people, um, ask comments. I was only told, I was told not to go to the emergency unless an AF session was bothering me. And she says, I'm not sure what improved health outcomes means. So I guess it's it can be sometimes challenging for patients to decide or people to decide, you know, is this bad enough to go to emergency or not? Or should I just wait and see? Um, and so I don't know if you have any thoughts about that or, or people commented in your focus groups about that kind of dilemma about when to call on their healthcare providers and when to kind of manage it themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it certainly is a question. It didn't, it didn't come up probably in our focus groups as much, but it certainly has in some of our other research for sure, uh, that that is a, a very common type of um, decision that patients are having to make. And it, it's, I think it's particularly difficult when you're newly diagnosed with your, with a fib to know when you should be going. Um, I think once you become more comfortable with kind of a little bit of the rhythm of your disease process, I think you, you can probably a wait and see, right? Um, but I think that in those early days, it can be very, very challenging. Um, I do think that a lot of it really depends on the severity. Like if it's certainly like we, uh, because in the early stages, your the AFib should should likely go away a bit, right? Uh, it should it should sort of go. It, you may have it, and it probably will resolve fairly quickly. So if it doesn't resolve, if you're if you're still experiencing sort of that really rapid heart rate, um, it's better for you actually to go to the ED if you're you know um, because it can be very debilitating. And so I even think I know I work a lot in rural communities, and so the and the GPs there will tell their patients that they really should go because it's better for them actually to be seen and treated because you don't want that racing heart, racing heart, that's not good um, mm -hmm. for your heart over the long term. And so I think it really, a lot of it really does depend on if you are, you know, if you're really, um, 
um, if you've kind of put up with it, you put up with it for, you know, as long as you can, um, but it really, if it doesn't resolve within a really reasonable period of time, um, I would say go to the ED. Um, I know that you are there. They do discourage, um, they oftentimes discourage patients from going there, um, but I think if you're in doubt um, and you're particularly, um, yeah, you're, you're just uncertain, I, I think I would head off to the ED. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. This next question is kind of one that I'm interested in as well, because one of the comments or one of your main themes is that, um, you know, the patient's ability to communicate is such a critical factor in this virtual, virtual healthcare. Mm -hmm. So it puts a lot of um, pressure on patients to be able to figure out what they should communicate and in what detail. And so this question about is the use of cardio mobile devices recommended? And is this assistance available uh, for use via the AFib clinic or elsewhere? And so it kind of relates to this issue of, are there ways that technology might assist patients in communicating their needs? I don't know if you have thoughts about that, Lindsay or, mm -hmm. or Kathy, is, is how we can put, how we can help patients out with communicating their needs. Lindsay, did you want to talk to that or I, what? Sure. Yeah, I know. Like there was definitely one of the suggestions that our participants had was being able to, to incorporate a lot more of that kind of biometric data. Cause I mean, even a lot of these smartwatches nowadays yeah. collect a lot of information that, that patients want to be able to share with their physicians. And I think, you know, um, it's, kind of getting over that hump in order to making it usual practice and, and how we can support physicians and using that information, supporting patients mm -hmm. as well. A lot of our participants had at home blood pressure machines that they regularly checked and kind of self-monitoring as part of that. And in previous work that we've done, even a lot of patients self-monitored there, you know, a lot of patients go on warfarin, a blood thinner, and you have to check your levels to make sure that you're, you're in the right zone. And a lot of patients did a lot of their own self-monitoring and that was really helpful for them. It gives you, you know, control and, and a lot of confidence because it helps you get to know your symptom experience and, and that as you go through AFib. And one of the things we've been discussing as well is that these are all great, but making sure it's available to patients because there's, there's a cost barrier and a lot of people taking right. advantage of these technologies. Yeah. Or it could be very simple. I mean, if patients are keeping a little notebook record yeah. of their yeah. blood pressure yeah. or this, they could actually just take a picture of it and email yeah. it to their doctors, yes. right? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, there are some very simple strategies that, that could be incorporated. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I grant, I agree with you. It, um, it d would take some willingness on the, and, and effort maybe on the part of healthcare providers to facilitate that as well. Um, I think that increase. I think increasingly, Joan, there are efforts like the. Um, there are different pl some platforms that people are, um, you know, adopting like patient portals and th those types mm -hmm. of things where patients can actually, you know, they can actually send that those securely through to the to the provider that mm -hmm. hasn't come to the clinic at this point in time. Um, and so that, but so again, it isn't then up to the patient then to kind of keep those records and be able to, like you said, ready to share them with their, with their uh, physician. But I think having those patterns and trends is really, really important uh, for providers to actually help patients um, right. rather than sort of a single reading, right? It, it's it's yeah. nice to keep a record of things. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess the question is, how can we motivate providers to take that step? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe we all need to do some lobbying there. And yeah. yeah, it suggests that virtually your phone appointments are fine if you're reviewing meds, but not if you're addressing real concerns about the condition. So mm -hmm. it speaks to this um, need maybe for patients to have a choice that occasionally they might really want or need that in-person visit. Mm -hmm. And so maybe this is not an all or none kind of thing. Um, so there's that. I'm going to quickly go on because there's like a whole bunch of questions and comments here. <laughs> Danielle says, virtual works, but would like to have access to a cardiologist or the clinic in person at regular interviews to monitor and reassure <laughs> just to see if things have changed. So it sort of speaks to this idea of having some choice mm -hmm. and occasionally having that 
availability of an in-person visit. Yes. Um, yeah. Or even like even a Zoom meeting, like a Zoom yes. might work actually, at least a Zoom gives you a little bit more in terms of you can actually see the person, they can see you, and there's a certain amount of assessment even that a, a provider can do um, on a Zoom call, but a phone is really very limited. In, so it, it puts so much onus on the patient to have to, um, you know, be prepared to to give the information uh, to the provider. and But the provider also needs to ask good questions uh, as well to make right. sure to, to be able to get at the information that perhaps, you know, is missing uh, as patients right. talked about. Yes, mm -hmm. totally. There's a lot of responsibility here for the provider. It's not totally mm -hmm. on the patient. No, shoulders. no, no. So we have a comment from Henry um, who says he had an ablation in February, 2021, had a couple of calls from the clinic since then, the AFib clinic. Uh, but he's wondering, he's not sure if he's still a patient at the clinic. So are you likely to still be a patient if you've been treated once? Do you know? I think, I think, I think he would be, right? Because I think that uh, if he was a... Uh... If he was referred, generally there are follow-up visits after an ablation. So I think that he would be carried for as long as those follow-up appointments were necessary. Oh, wait, 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 no, 21? Maybe 21. not. Yeah, yeah 21. They, he might they not be. For a yeah. certain amount of follow-up appointments and usually yes. the discharge at, 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 12, at 6 to 12 months. But I mean, right. that, that speaks to some of the things that we saw in our focus groups where it's just that unsure what like where am I in this pathway of treatment how, how am I attached to these people and, and all of that so clinics need to do some better communication with their patients give them a heads up that you know your your time yeah. with us is over and now you're back to your GP is that how it works yeah that's okay. I think that's really important and, and actually Henry we didn't present I, I had we had slides in there to present on the follow-up communication but there were gaps in that um, because pa that's what patients did find if they had a relapse, for example, or if they were expecting that maybe they had to be seen again, they had received any communication. So they were a bit out of the loop, they said, and, um, and even trying to get through to the clinic sometimes was challenging um, uh, to, to kind of address those follow-up questions they had. So that was, cer certainly that did come out of our findings as well. Mm -hmm. um, so they do need, I think, a better um, a map. And I think that that was one of the patients did talk. I mean, I need kind of a, uh, you know, I need to kind of have it mapped out about what my options are and what, you know, when I'm going to be seen or when I need to be seen or when I'm going to be let go and who, you know, my GP, my, yeah. So I think that there is a lot that needs to be done to um, help patients um, along that traje trajectory. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Agnes asks about the future of virtual care in BC really related to atrial fibrillation. And I guess it partly, you know, now that we're almost post pandemic, maybe, well, we're at a different stage for sure. Um, will there be in person follow up available at the BGH atrial fib clinic going forward? So I guess just again wondering. Do patients really have an option for in-person? Probably a year or so ago, maybe there wasn't much option for in-person, but I would think there's some option now. Yeah, and there there was some options during the whole uh, period. It just, they were very infrequent. And, and any patients that were seen in person, we didn't include in our sample because um, we were looking specifically at virtual, but um I don't see them not using virtual, but I know that they're they have been increasing the amount of in-person visits that they've that they've been having even in the last yeah. couple of years. Yeah. And I, and I do think, Joan, that even uh, patients who really did feel that they needed to be seen, like I said, like I, I presented that one example of that one patient who just wasn't satisfied with the phone and finally, you know, did um, a, an in-person visit did occur. And so I think if patients really, really felt like they needed to, that that would happen. So that they might not necessarily have the option at the beginning, but I do think that it, it could be uh, negotiated with the providers um, as, as needed. Yeah. So there's kind of two related comments uh, next that um, one related to the issue of, you know, the, the whether virtual care can really handle the complexity of various health issues, whether it's AFib or, or mm -hmm. other, other health conditions, you know, where is the kind of limit? And on the other hand, Richard is saying, during the presentation, the term mundane was used with respect <laughs> to questions. And so as a patient, he's saying, you know, from my perspective, 
there's no issues that are mundane. It's like, yeah. they're all really important to, yeah. uh, to, and, and potentially life-changing events. So it's, it's like this whole gamut can virtual care really uh, address all of this um, in, in a thorough way and a respectful way, I guess, that whatever issues are brought up, um, that they're dealt with appropriately. Yeah. I, I agree. And, and Richard, you make, we, that was a, that was a term, we should have put it in quotes, but mundane was a, was a, uh, a term that one of the participants used, right? And when they were referring to mundane, they were, I think they were talking about the re prescription refills and some of those things that were kind of ordinary things. Um, and, but you're quite right. I, everything needs to be taken seriously and nothing really is mundane. But when they were, when, when they were referring to that, that's what they were referring to. I do think that there is absolutely a need for hybrid. Like we, we can't deal with all the complexities and AFib can be very, very complex. Um, some patients, especially if you've got a lot of comorbidities or you've got other kinds of things going on um, that you really, you know, you meet, you, you, like in person, maybe the only way to go with some of those complexities. And um, so I don't, we don't have sort of the magic formula, I think, for how we can combine in-person and, and um, virtual care, but you're quite right. What, what, uh, you know, what should be seen in person and what, you know, what is it okay to do um, virtually is, is really still uh, out there for a discussion. Uh, yeah. And it, I think it is a huge discussion too in the medical world, like they're also trying to figure that out. Uh, so I know as patients, we want to have answers to that. And, um, but I do think that, uh, th yeah, that, that providers are also trying to address that too, because they don't, they want to give the best care possible. There's no doubt they want to provide the best care and not to have things missed because even they also um, are concerned about missing things uh, with virtual care. So uh, like, I think both patients and providers are sort of on the same page with many of these things. That's great, that's great. Well, there's some questions that we didn't get to, unfortunately, but uh, for those people who did have questions that relate to some of their medical issues, I'd encourage them to contact their healthcare providers with those questions because mm -hmm. we weren't able to get to them today and our time has run out. So I do want to close by really a very warm and uh, generous thank you to both uh, Kathy and Lindsay for sharing this really, really important research today. There were lots of thank yous in the comments as well. Um, and I join uh, all of our attendees today in, in really thanking you. This has been really, really interesting. I know we could have talked a lot longer, but we'll hope to have you back again to mm -hmm. share the rest of your results <laughs> yeah. when yeah. you have finished analyzing all that data. That'd be um, great. I know we have people who'd love to hear about them. So um, thank you once again. And I want to thank everyone who joined us today as well. Um, although this is our last session for Embrace Aging, we do have other uh, webinars coming up. And if you go to the Institute for Healthy Living and Chronic Disease Prevention website at UBC Okanagan, uh, you'll find a list of those events. And so we hope you will see you at some of them. And as I mentioned, um, our events for Embrace Aging are also recorded. So if you go onto the Embrace Aging website, you'll find a link to the YouTube recordings, which you can view and also share links with anyone who else who might also find them helpful. So thank you. Have a great day. And we hope to see everyone again soon. Bye for Bye now. Bye all.